Hello and welcome to the History of London with me Peter Stone. For this episode I'm in Wapping in East London and I'm going to look at what is Britain's longest serving police force and this is where you'll find it. For hundreds of years until the middle of the 19th century, if you wanted to cross the River Thames, you had to pass over London Bridge because it was the only bridge in the London area. But with only one crossing, it was always congested. So the easiest and fastest way to cross the Thames, or to travel between places along it, was to hire a boat from one of the many stairs that once led down into the river, and be rowed to your destination by watermen, the equivalent of modern taxi drivers. Look at how many stairs there were in just a short section of the river in this map from the middle of the 18th century. Most of those stairs have long gone, but a few still exist, such as here at Wapping. Wapping is on the north bank of the Thames, just a little east and downstream from the Tower of London. It's an area that was long associated with ships and their cargoes in the days when London was a busy port. Wapping then consisted of massive warehouses and riverside wharves. The ships have long gone from this part of the Thames, but you can still see the remnants of the many old wharves that line this part of the river. This is Wapping High Street. You won't find many of the usual things you'd find in a high street, like shops for example, but here are those former wharves and warehouses converted into apartments after they ended their working life in the 1980s. Until the 1970s there was also a massive complex of docks here at Wapping, built in the early 19th century by the London Dock Company. Many types of commodity passed through the London docks at Wapping, but it was particularly well known for wines arriving from the continent. This is where ships would enter the London docks from the river at Pier Head, now converted into a garden. And the buildings where dock officials were based are now very desirable residences. After the docks closed, most of its warehouses and other buildings were demolished and have been replaced with housing, and here a football pitch but the local church is still known as St Peter London Docks. The eastern part of the dock complex remains in use for water sports. This surviving building of Wapping's London Docks is Tobacco Dock. It was designed by the famous engineer John Rennie and completed in 1812. As the name suggests, it was used to store tobacco that arrived from Virginia. In recent times it briefly became a shopping centre and since then has been used as an exhibition and event space. Back in the past, this was a busy area, with ships being loaded and unloaded, and the streets full of dockers. And wherever there were working men and sailors, there would be pubs, and Wapping was no exception. There were once 36 pubs around here, and several of them still survive. This is the prospect of Whitby. The original building dates back to 1520, when it was known as the Devil's Tavern. A sign outside the pub lists every English monarch since it opened, from Henry VIII to Charles III. The unusual name of the prospect of Whitby derives from a collier ship that used to moor nearby in the 19th century. The town of Ramsgate can trace its history back to the 15th century. It's had its current name since 1811, named after the fishermen of Ramsgate who would land their catch here to avoid paying taxes further upstream at Billingsgate Market. Another pub in the street is the Captain Kidd. It looks old but was converted from a 19th century building into a pub in the 1980s. The name is a reminder that when pirates were caught, they were hanged along this stretch of the river, one of whom was, of course, the unfortunate Captain William Kidd. Now let's go back to the start of this story about police. 
To more easily manage the collection of customs duties, a law was passed during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, restricting London's imports and exports to a short section of riverside between London Bridge and the Tower of London, and those wharves were known as the Legal Keys. That's a very short stretch of river, just a few ship lengths. It probably seemed like a great idea in the 16th century, but over the next hundred years, London's maritime trade increased exponentially. New English colonies and trading bases were established around the world, from North America and the Caribbean to the Far East. All manner of goods and foodstuffs were arriving for the city's growing population, such as silks, furs, spices, tea, coffee, sugar, tobacco and rum. At the same time, London became a manufacturing centre. Raw materials such as coal and metals were imported, and newly made products could be sent around the world. The Thames became extremely congested. The requirement for goods to pass through the legal keys began to create a major bottleneck. At any time, hundreds of ships were lined up along the Thames waiting to unload. The writer Daniel Defoe wrote of the Thames being a sea of masts as sailing ships anchored alongside each other right across the river. In fact, such was the congestion that it was impossible for ships to actually reach the legal keys. Cargoes had to be offloaded onto smaller boats that then negotiated their way around the other moored vessels to reach the designated spot where goods were required to be landed. Yet the congestion didn't end there. The quaysides and surrounding streets in the City of London were piled high with goods that sat waiting for lengthy periods before they could be carted away. Ships arriving with valuable cargoes could sometimes wait for weeks on end to unload with just a skeleton crew aboard. While the ships sat on the river, they were quite unprotected, so became prey to thieves, often in league with port workers and corrupt customs officers. The criminals worked on an industrial scale, and a vast amount of cargo was being stolen by well-organised armed gangs. Now this story takes a rather dark digression. As the 18th century progressed, there was an increasing outrage about the harsh treatment of enslaved labourers on the sugar plantations of Britain's colonies in the West Indies. There was a growing demand for the abolition of slavery. But many of those who profited from slavery were wealthy and influential people. Some of them were ship owners, MPs in Parliament, Lord Mayors of London, Governors of the Bank of England and so on. Others were absentee owners of sugar plantations and involved in the slave trade. To oppose the abolitionist movement, they banded together to form the West India Committee. Why do I mention all this? Well, sugar was an extremely valuable commodity back then. A large part of the pilferage on the Thames was from ships arriving from the plantations, and the men of the West India Committee were naturally not too happy about it. And it was at that point that two men, separately, began to think about the issue. John Harriet was a colourful character. He had served in the Navy from the age of 13, had lived with indigenous natives in America, and had been wounded fighting for the East India Company. In 1795, he returned to England where he heard from his magistrate uncle about theft from ships on the Thames. Harriet made a proposal to the Lord Mayor of London to create a police force to combat theft on the river, but the reply came back that it wasn't the Mayor's problem. There was a similar response from the Duke of Portland, the Home Secretary. Harriet was then introduced to the Scotsman, social reformer and former Mayor of Glasgow, Patrick Cahoon, who was living in London. Cahoon had about that same time written a treatise on forming a police force for London, similar to what was already operating in France. His ideas were read by no less than King George III. Cahoon estimated that over half a million pounds worth of goods were being stolen from ships at anchor on the Thames each year, which was a lot of money back then. During Cahoon's time in Glasgow, the city was undergoing a transformation from a wealthy commercial town into a major industrial city. Its rapid growth created social unrest and crime, and there were early experiments with a salaried police force. Another of Cahoon's circle of associates was the radical philosopher and social reformer Jeremy Bentham, whose many ideas led to the creation of the modern prison system and the establishment of London's first university. Bentham insisted that after he died in 1832, his body should be preserved and exhibited, and it can still be seen in the university. The West India Committee heard about Cahoon's theories and estimates. He advised them that a river police force should be set up, and that off-river docks be created, where goods could be unloaded behind secure walls. 
Remember I said earlier that John Harriet had approached the Duke of Portland with his idea for a police force but had been turned down? But the West India Committee were much more influential men. They made basically the same proposal to the Duke, pointing out that theft from ships on the Thames was depriving the government of customs duties it badly needed during the time of the Napoleonic Wars. The Duke was aware that the idea of a police force was not popular with the public, particularly with the more influential upper classes, so was unwilling to help fund it. But following the approach from the West India Committee, he agreed to pay the cost of two magistrates for the force. So Cahoon was given the go-ahead to create a marine police force by the West India Committee to protect their ships and cargoes. And Harriet and Cahoon were appointed as the first two magistrates to whom anyone arrested by the marine police could be taken for trial. I hope you're enjoying this video. If that's the case, please click the like button, which lets YouTube know to recommend it to other people. Perhaps click the subscribe button as well, then you can watch more episodes on other London history topics I hope you'll find interesting. And why not recommend it to your friends? Now the idea of an organised force to combat crime in London wasn't entirely new. There had long been constables and night watchmen, but their job wasn't to prevent crime, it was just to catch the perpetrators after a crime had been committed. But they only worked within their individual parish, so offenders just had to run a couple of blocks into the next parish to avoid arrest. Night watchmen were often elderly men, so it was never difficult for a criminal to run away. Some years before the Marine Police Force, the Covent Garden magistrate John Fielding had created the Bow Street Runners, but they were really detectives who searched for stolen property when it was reported to them. The West India Marine Police was something new, a private security force under a central command with four-time salaried constables tasked with protecting certain ships by preventing theft as well as having the power of arrest. Cahoon's new force was given the glorious name of the West India Merchants and Planters Marine Police Institution and started operating in July 1798 with 80 full-time policemen. The most important skills required were to row a boat, brandish a sword and fire a musket, so many of the early constables were former naval men who had fought in the recent Battle of the Nile under Rear Admiral Horatio Nelson. A set of rules was created. It was stressed that their objective was to prevent mischief towards the property of the West India merchants, and that its operations should be carried out with zeal and firmness, but also caution. Arms should only be used as a last resort in self-defence. Suspected felons should be taken before the magistrates and dealt with according to the law. Anyone who obstructed a constable in his duty could be fined or even transported to a colony for up to seven years. Constables patrolled the river in rowboats from London Bridge downstream to Blackwall Reach on the east side of the Isle of Dogs. It was carried out on a rotor basis, so there would always be two police boats out on the river at any time, with each patrol lasting six hours. Now it does seem to me that rowing up and down the Thames for six hours every day in all weathers, day and night, must have been a pretty tough job. But they were quite well paid for those times, and also received a bonus in the form of a percentage of all stolen cargo they seized. The month after patrols began, the Times newspaper reported that It is astonishing the effects the institution has already achieved in the preventing of piracies and robberies, as well as that of illicit trade on the river. Instead of numbers of boats engaged all night in nefarious purposes, since the regular night surveys of police boats have taken place upon Mr Cohen's plan, nothing is to be seen upon the river. It was from Wapping where many of the criminal gangs operated, a well-organised trade in which stolen goods could be quickly brought ashore, processed and sold. Here we are back at Wapping Old Stairs, which leads straight to the High Street, right beside the town of Ramsgate pub I mentioned earlier. They were already called Old Stairs in the early 18th century, so it must be pretty ancient. Many of those stealing from ships would have carried their loot straight up these stairs from the river and sold the booty in any of the 36 pubs, so Cahoon decided his police force and the magistrates would be based close to here, on one of the very spots that had been used for executing pirates. Of course the criminal gangs of Wapping were far from happy about this obstacle to their business. In October 1798 an Irish coal heaver was arrested for stealing coal and went before John Harriet. While the case was being heard, a crowd of several hundred attacked the police office in Wapping High Street. Cahoon and Harriet, protected by several officers, read the riot act and ordered the crowd to disperse. Instead, the mob continued their attack, shooting at two of Cahoon's men. The defenders drew their cutlasses and fired with pistols, which dispersed the rioters. But two days later, one of Cahoon's men, Gabriel Franks, passed away from his wounds, the first officer to die on duty. The ringleaders of the right were quickly rounded up, 
one was hanged and six transported to the colonies for life. You'll remember that one of Cahoon's recommendations was for the West India Committee to create off-river docks behind secure walls. Well, they did just that. They created the West India Docks, which in more recent times has been replaced by Canary Wharf. And then other merchants created the London Docks here at Wapping. Some of the high walls that surrounded the London Docks to provide security can still be seen today. Other dock systems also opened along the Thames, the East India Docks, St Catharines, Surrey Commercial Docks and so on. And each of these employed their own internal police force within their docks, mainly to prevent pilfering by the dockers. These houses close to Canary Wharf were built as homes for the police officers of the West India docks. Now once the West India ships could unload in their secure docks, there was no longer a need for their own private police force. But as we have heard, Cahoon's River Police had not only protected the West India ships, but their presence deterred theft from all vessels on the Thames. The government were very happy with the increase in customs duties, so in 1800 they passed the Police Act, making Cahoon's force a public body called the Marine Police Establishment and covering the whole tidal Thames and its tributaries, right down river to Chatham and Sheerness. The geographical area that had to be covered had massively increased, so new Thames police stations were gradually opened, initially on retired naval ships, and in those early days the police continued to patrol in rowing and sailing boats. Now let's think about policing in the rest of London. The population as a whole was increasing and the size of the conurbation growing. The ancient system of parish night watchmen was totally inadequate. Being a watchman was not something the ordinary working citizen wished to take part in and therefore it was generally left to the least able men in society. They also tended to be some of the poorest people and often supplemented their income by taking bribes from criminals. The result was that crime in London in the 18th century was rampant and there were also occasional riots. When an attempt to create a police force to cover Westminster and the City of London was made by William Pitt the Younger in 1785, it faltered because the City of London's aldermen considered it stepped on their toes and it was also considered too French. The upper classes resented the implementation of higher taxes to pay for a police force and didn't want to be told what to do by working class police. They tended to believe the best prevention of crime and disorder was harsher punishments. At the same time, the lower classes considered that the police force would simply be to repress them while only protecting the property of the wealthy. In 1822, Robert Peel was appointed as Home Secretary and he began a radical reform of criminal law. It was under Peel that London's Metropolitan Police Force was formed to replace the system of parish watchmen. It covered Westminster and parts of the counties of Middlesex, Surrey and Kent. Once again, the City of London objected, so the city was excluded. The introduction of the Metropolitan Police didn't initially have any effect on the Thames Police, which continued to operate as an independent body under the control of magistrates. It wasn't until 1839 that the Marine Police were amalgamated into the Metropolitan Police under the name of the Thames Division. The marine policemen were still patrolling in rowing boats when Britain's worst maritime disaster took place. On a summer evening in 1878, the Princess Alice paddle steamer was returning to London with well over 800 day trippers on board. As it approached a heavy collier boat that was coming downstream, there was confusion as to which side each vessel should pass the other. The result was that the collier tore into the paddle steamer, which sank within minutes. It took a lengthy time for the river police to arrive at the scene in their rowing boats by when well over 600 people had drowned in the heavily polluted river. Following the disaster, the marine police finally began to acquire steam launches to speed up their response to any emergency and in the early 20th century they were replaced by petrol-powered vessels. The Thames and its various docks and wharves were a prime target for enemy bombers during the Second World War. Younger police officers were called up into the armed services, so during the war the river police was manned by older officers. Even so, as the bombs fell from the sky during the Blitz, the river police became an essential service, rescuing people from burning ships and riverside buildings. Their station at Wapping was used as a casualty clearing centre and evacuation point for those left homeless. On one occasion there was a near miss when a parachute bomb landed beside the Wapping building, destroying several police boats. 
Since the war, the Marine Police launches have been continually replaced with ever more suitable, faster and more responsive vessels, including rapid response, rigid inflatable boats. In 1967, an underwater diving team was formed, based at the Wapping Station. I learnt more about the team by visiting one of its retired members and discovered that Mackenzie Moulton is not only an expert diver, but also a gifted artist and musician. To be selected for the underwater search unit, you had to do a fitness test first. And they made you run up four flights of stairs with a 56 pound weight. Um, and there was sort of a timing. There'd be one officer down the bottom with a stopwatch and one at the top. And uh, the one that uh, got the best time then went on to the next uh, test, which was to go to the local swimming pool with a blacked out mask and sit on the bottom for 20 minutes and to see whether you freaked out not being able to see anything. Because 90% of our diving was in nil visibility. Uh, then you would be, go on a selection board and uh, give any present qualifications. Uh, fortunately, I was a sports diver and had sports diver qualifications, so um, I stood more of a chance than others to actually get in the unit. The Metropolitan Police Diving Unit uh, consists of 11 members, all specialised in diving, some are supervisors. Um, in the team, uh, to do a dive, there's normally five members minimum. That would be the diver, who is actually doing the operation, and his handler. The standby diver, for safety reasons, and his handler. And a supervisor to supervise the dive. We dive in any form of water. That could be the River Thames, canals, uh, cesspits, um, in... Uh, water tanks on top of tire blocks, anywhere they require us to dive and recover property or bodies or anything, basically. When I first joined the diving unit in 1983, most of uh, the searching was for stolen property or guns used in murders or bank robberies uh, and uh, general recovery of cars that had gone in just to make sure there was nothing inside the car. Uh, but as time progressed, we got more and more involved in security searching, i.e. that might be if the Queen was coming up in Britannia, uh, we would search under Britannia to see no explosive devices were put there. And, all, and then later on, we got involved in uh, searching for drugs under boats. Uh, this would be in combined search with customs and excise. They would search the top of the ship and uh, we would search underneath. Usually it was something strapped to the bilge kill. Uh, one of our diving operations was to recover a solo motorcycle that had been stolen. We were called by foot duty to go and search West India Dock. Um, and uh, when we got there, uh, we were told there might be other vehicles down there. Um, so anyway, I was the first diver in looking for the uh, motorcycle and um, it was quite crowded down there, more like national car parks. There were so many vehicles on top of one another, it was quite difficult to search. And one of the vehicles we found was a Rolls Royce. Uh, so anyway, I reported to the surface what we'd found. We hadn't yet found the motorcycle and um, they called up a garage to recover the Rolls Royce. The others they weren't really interested in. So anyway, when the Rolls Royce was recovered and brought to the surface, I asked the uh, guy that was uh, lifting it out what they're going to do with the Rolls Royce. And he said, well, he said, it's the most valuable car down there. It has been stolen and prob they probably paid out the owner so will clean it up, they'll probably be on the forecourt within three weeks. There was one search I remember in particular that was quite funny. Um, we were, we had to go to the Regents Canal to do a security search um, and the Regents Canal is quite close to the American um, Embassy house where the President stays 
when he comes over. Uh, so anyway, we started searching the Regent's Canal, making sure there were no explosives or anything like that inside there. We found plenty of other things that were actually stolen, but uh, one interesting thing we found was a package covered in greaseproof paper. Uh, when we got the got it out, it was taken to uh, a control point where anything we found was supposed to be taken and it was found to be an automatic pistol with ammunition. Uh, they were quite pleased that we'd found this because we found out later that the uh, American, um, American CIA or, or security services had actually planted this because someone told them that there, was, there would be no way that the Metropolitan Police Underwater Search Unit would find this gun. So we were very pleased to show that our searching is 100%. If it's in there, we'll find it. Many other operations carried out by the team are featured in Mackenzie's book, which you can buy online. But be warned that some of the chapters have very sad endings. If you want to see some more of Mackenzie's artwork, you can find it on his website at the address on the screen. In recent decades, the big ships have moved elsewhere, but the river remains busy with various types of smaller craft. History repeated itself in 1989 when the pleasure launch Marchioness, with a party in full swing, was struck by a larger commercial boat close to Southwark Bridge and it quickly sank. Sadly, 51 lives were lost, but on that occasion the Marine Police were able to respond much more swiftly than at the time of the Princess Alice disaster and they saved 50 of the 80 survivors. This memorial in Southwark Cathedral shows the names of all those who died. Someone who knows a thing or two about the history of the Thames Police is Rob Jeffries. I caught up with him at the Thames Police Museum, which is housed within the Wapping Police Station. I began by asking him how he came to join the Thames Police. I joined the Metropolitan Police in May 1973, uh, served 10 years on sea division at Western Central and then transferred to uh, Diplomatic Protection uh, Department, um, which I did for five years, but at the end of five years I decided I, I needed a, a move uh, and so I applied for Thames Division, which was something I'd always shown an interest in, uh, but never really felt it was the right time to apply. Uh, so I did my form, a 728, uh, showed it to a sergeant, uh, he read it through and said it was uh, not good enough, uh, it was boring, uh, and so he rewrote it for me. Uh, and when he showed it to me the next day, it compared me to Nelson, Drake, Vasco da Gama, but I was a bit better than all of those, in, according to this uh, sergeant. Uh, and I said, it's not strictly true, is it, Sarge? He said, it doesn't matter. He said, this will get a board. You will get a board from this, I guarantee it. What you do at the board is up to you and that will decide whether you actually get the job or not. So that's what happened. I applied, uh, I got the board, I lied through my teeth for all the questions there, but eventually they seemed satisfied uh, and I eventually got the job uh, and became a Thames Division Officer in 1988. 
When I joined Thames Division in 1988, our job was all about protecting life uh, and, and marine craft on the river. Uh, that was basically it. We would go out on the river, patrol, keeping people safe. The primary objective of police, as we learnt in 1973, is protection of life and prevention of crime. Uh, and as soon as I came down on Thames Division, you were literally on the front line, protecting lives uh, and pulling people out the river on, on many, many occasions. Today's police are rather different. After 9-11, policing changed all over the world, but particularly here in, in London. They were looking at ways in which terrorists might uh, affect London uh, and looking at ways in which it could be stopped. One of the things they spotted very early was that the river was almost unprotected. Uh, Thames Division officers weren't armed, uh, and so the question was asked, what happens if we need to deploy armed officers on the river? And so it was decided that they would liaise more carefully with armed officers, SO19, and nowadays these officers can be deployed very, very quickly and taken anywhere on the river uh, that needs to be done. They can also do the same with uh, specialist dogs, sniffer dogs or drug dogs, for example. Uh, they could be taken out in, in rigid inflatables uh, and deployed on the river. Uh, this can be quite dangerous work. It involves climbing up the sides of, of ships from, from rigid inflatables. And so the people have to be taught how to do these things uh, and do them properly. So when we're not actually involved in this type of work, in fact, uh, we are involved in training uh, and, and facilitating other officers in their work. When people ask me what significant events took place in my 32-year police career, um, it's really quite simple for me. In 1989, the Marchioness disaster. The Marchioness changed policing on the river for good. Uh, it was never, ever going to be the same again. The room we were in was an old carpenter's workshop and part of the police station since the late 1800s. Uh, it served that purpose for, for many, many years until they decided they needed a new uh, purpose-built workshops uh, a couple of hundred yards upriver. So this freed up this space uh, and it, the question was asked by the gentleman in this picture here, John Joslin, uh, whether this space could be used to house our historic collection, which was stored away upstairs. Uh, the then Commissioner, Sir Robert Mark, uh, said yes. Uh, and so Jos spent a lot of time and effort filling up this place with all the things you see here. The Marchioness disaster highlighted the need for a greater emphasis on safety on the Thames. As a result, in 2002, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution opened four lifeboat stations on the Tidal River, from Teddington down to Gravesend. As we have heard from Mackenzie and Rob, the work of the Thames Police has thus changed in recent decades. With extremely fast vessels and greater emphasis on more routine security work, there was less need for stations at various points along the river, so they were all closed, except for the one at Wapping. They are still part of the Metropolitan Police, but have had yet another name change in recent times, and are known as the Marine Policing Unit. The original office was rebuilt in 1870, but after more than 200 years, the Thames Police are still here on the same site where they began. Many thanks for watching this episode of the History of London. You can read more about London's history on my website, www.thehistoryoflondon.co.uk And you can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. If you want to learn more about the importance of the Port of London to the capital's history, you can check out my book, The History of the Port of London, A Vast Emporium of All Nations, which you can buy from online retailers or order from your local bookstore. And I hope to see you again here on another episode of The History of London with me, Peter Stone. In the meantime, bye for now.